Thank you. Thanks for being here tonight. So how many people think they're addicted to the internet? Good. The rest of you are lying. No, I'm just <laughs> joking. Um, you know, it's really interesting. When I started looking at this phenomena, which was probably in the mid to late 1990s, 96, 97, when the internet really first hit, um, we did a study. I contacted ABC News and we put up a survey on one of their websites, abcnews.com, and we wanted to see how people use the internet. Now this is during its infancy, during 97, 98. So we, it's, it wasn't like it is now with everyone having high speed access. This is back when people were dialing up. I don't know if people, some of us I know remember that. You know, that weird sound that you would get, you know. I never quite figured out what that sound was really about. But anyway, you know what I'm talking about. So what we found is, is that 90% of people lose track of time and space when they're on the internet. 90%. And that figure is probably closer to 100 now. So what, what does that mean, that 90% lose track of time and space when they're online? What it means is that the internet, there's something about the internet, and now of course when I use the internet, today we have to include other things, which I will talk about tonight. When I talk about the internet, we're talking about something that seems to change mood and consciousness. It's what we would call psychoactive, like a drug. It has some impact on our consciousness in some way that compels us to lose track of time or to experience the technical term for it is dissociation. So just like when you're driving in a car and you're going down the highway and you kind of lose track of time and then you end up 10 exits further and you're like, I don't remember being in the car during that time. That's dissociation. It's a normal experience. It can be pleasurable. It happens every day. You can read a good book, go to a movie. But there's something about the internet specifically, and we think we know what those things are, that produce that sense of dissociation. So suffice it to say that the internet is a psychoactive medium. It alters mood, alters consciousness. Now, you remember I said that to talk about the internet, you can't really just talk about the internet now because the internet is accessed by so many portals. The internet is now, in fact, the most common way to access the internet now is fast becoming the smartphone. Where's my smartphone? These things. Uh, this is becoming the dominant way that people are accessing uh, the internet. So when I talk about the internet, I'm talking about laptops, desktop computers, game systems that are integrated into the internet. Many of you have those in your home. Uh, many of your kids use them. PDAs smartphones, iPhones, iPads, all the smart pads that are coming out, and there are going to be a million of them. In fact, that's going to be the, the fastest growth area will be in the pads and in the smartphones. Uh, the computer, as we know it, the laptop and desktop, is going to be phasing out. Probably within 10 years, you really won't see many of them because the internet is going to be the hard drive of the world. And we'll, we'll talk more about what that means. With me so far? How many people, when they're online, find that, that they lose track of time and space? You know, like you think less time has gone by than it really has. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's why we have laptops and iPads. Yeah, it, obviously, this kid didn't have an iPad because it's kind of heavy to lug that big computer across the parking lot. Did everyone get what he was doing? Kind of cute. So 8 to 10% of American youth are either abusing or addicted to video games or computers right now. I can show you all the statistics. I don't want to take the time in showing you all the math and all the statistics. I want to, all these things are backed up by um, stories, and I can send you copies of the slides if you want. But um, when I did my study, we looked at about 23,000 kids, uh, kids, people, adults and children, and we had a number about 6%. Now, the numbers probably, I've seen studies that have come out that are anywhere between 4 and 10% that are using the computer, the internet, or gaming device in a way that is excessive to a point where they are addicted. Now, addicted doesn't mean they like to use it, or they're on it for an hour a day, 
or they're doing it instead of their homework. Addictive means that it's affecting one of the major spheres of their life, social relationships, work or academic performance, uh, relationships with family, financial issues. Obviously, with children, it wouldn't be as relevant. Uh, legal problems, and there are many issues with kids and adolescents that get in trouble online with legal issues. I deal with a lot of them. Um, what else is there? Did I leave anything out? Those are sort of the major ones. If you see mood changes, obviously, are a big part of it. So the number is probably closer to six to seven percent. Oh, th these are actually my kids a long time ago. That's sort of from People Magazine. Okay. Can you really be addicted to the internet? Let's talk about what that is. You're not really addicted to the computer or the internet. What we find is that when people use the internet, they are elevating a certain neurochemical in their brain. And there's been, now we have, when we first started doing this, we didn't have this data, but now we have data that look at either PET scans or functional MRIs, and we can see an increase in glucose uptake in the areas of the brain that are pleasure-oriented. And the neurotransmitter that's associated with that is dopamine. So when people use video games, the internet, the computer, actually, when you check your PDA, when you check your smartphone for email, you're actually getting a dopamine hit. And I wanted to explain to you why. This is actually very interesting. When we started looking at why people abuse all these devices, why do they spend so much time? Why do people check their email on average of 35 times a day? That's the national average right now. Um, and it's gone up and up and up and up. Why do you think people check their email every day, uh, 35 times a day? Really, what we have found is that the internet and, the comp and all the devices that access the internet are really the world's biggest slot machine, okay? Does that make sense? We have created, the inter inadvertently, nobody realized this when the internet was uh, in invented, it wasn't really invented, but as it was developed. The reason why it's the world's largest slot machine is because every once in a while you get something good. But if you were in front of a slot machine and every once in a while you got something good, money I assume, or now they don't even give you money, they give you credits or or whatever, um, but you knew when you were going to get it, and you knew how much, how long do you think you would stand there? Not very long. You would get up and leave very quickly, because it's predictable. So the, 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 the factor that's really relevant here and that's important is that it has to be variable in both the frequency and, and also in terms of the saliency. In other words, what it is has to change. So when you go on your email or you, your text, or when we talk about Facebook, it's the same thing, by the way. Facebook, the reason why Facebook has 800 million people on it is because it is the world's largest slot machine, and it literally is the world's largest slot machine, because it's dynamic and it's changing. Because you don't know what you're going to see every time you go on it, and because the landscape is changing in your email, in your text, even surfing is the same thing. Everything about the internet functions on a variable ratio reinforcement schedule. Now, anybody that remembers their basic psychology 101, there's something very unique about a variable ratio reinforcement schedule. Anybody remember what that really unique thing is? It's an operant conditioning schedule. Uh, the person that made it famous was B.F. Skinner. OK, I, luckily, I know. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so I'm going to tell you that it's the most resistant schedule of reinforcement to extinction. So what does that mean? That means is that you'll push this button a lot with nothing good coming down the pike for a long time before you'll stop pushing it. So that means even if you don't get a good email for a day or two or a week or a good text or an interesting text, you will keep looking and keep plugging stuff in. And the same for surfing, the same for emailing, the same for Facebook. It is resistant to extinction. That's why we have people that become addicted, or in more cases, we have people that are abusing the internet. And in, by and large, the vast majority of our culture, and by the way, the US is years behind other parts of the world in terms of this issue, 
both in terms of recognition of it as well as public education. We do no public education in the United States about this, but in other parts of the world where I've lectured, it's on billboards, how addictive the internet is, or putting down your cell phone, or leaving it home, or all that they have after school programs to get kids off the computer. It's amazing, but not in the US. Um, so every, even searching for a topic on Google works the same way, because every time you punch in a title or a search term, you don't know what you're going to get. You know you're going to get 80 million of them, but you don't know which one's going to be good, and you don't know how far you're going to have to go to find the one that's relevant. And then when you get it, what happens is your brain gets a little hit of dopamine, a little bit of a little hit, a little squirt, and then that's a, that's experienced as pleasure. Now you don't, you're not consciously recording that, you're not aware of that. This happens on an automatic and unconscious basis, and when we have that elevation of dopamine, there is a likelihood that we're going to repeat that behavior. So in variable um, ratio reinforcement schedules, that dopamine is delivered at such an unpredictable level that it keeps you going. That's why somebody will stand in front of a slot machine all day long knowing intellectually that they're going to lose their money. And if you ask them and said, listen, how often do you really, well, you know, I'm ahead, I'm behind, but do you think you're going to win ultimately in the long run? Not really, but I, can't, I kind of like it. And, and they're there for 10, 12 hours a day. Actually. We first started making comparisons from gambling to internet use uh, back in the late 1990s, and that's what got me to start doing the research that ended up with the book and other things. So variable ratio reinforcement schedule. Now there's other factors that seem to be relevant, and we'll talk about those. Uh, any questions so far? Variable ratio reinforcement schedule. OK. Um, now we have some unique, because this is a high school and, we're, and most of you are here because you all have children, right? How many of you have children, adolescents? God bless you. OK. I have two, 15 and 17. Um, it's very interesting what this group has done with technology. This generation, I call it Generation D, for digital. They have grown up, literally, from the ground, from the womb up, on this technology. Now, what's really interesting about this is that this is the first time in history that a younger generation automatically possesses more knowledge than the previous generation. So there has been a generational shift, a hierarchical shift in the way knowledge gets passed down. Previously, information and knowledge would get passed down from, what, from the senior generation to a junior generation over a process. And then eventually, that junior generation would uh, accumulate that knowledge and then pass it on to the next generation. But all bets are off. That's completely changed. This generation, 20, 25, 23, 22, and under, uh, this generation D, this technology, all of this technology, computers, laptops, video game, anything digital, um, is like a toaster to us. You know, like you go home and you assuming it's a basic toaster and nothing fancy, you pretty much can figure out how to put a slice of bread in the toaster and get some toast, right? You don't have to call your kid. But if you have a device, <laughs> say, how do, you, how do you make toast? But I have called my kid to how to turn on something on my cell phone, or why doesn't this thing on my laptop work, or what does this mean? That's the first time in history that that's happened. Now, why is that relevant? That's relevant because when there's a generational shift, when there's a power hierarchy shift, that changes the dynamics in the family. That changes how um, power and authority are being relegated. And in some cases, adolescents and children, but more adolescents, um, hold the family hostage because they are, they're the keepers of this knowledge. And the parents often feel helpless because they don't have the same amount of knowledge and they're reliant on their kids to tell them what they're doing and where they're doing it and what, what Facebook is and how you get on and how do you get off and, and unless the parents take the time to learn the technology. But remember, this is a harder thing for us. You know, I, I know this stuff and I write about it and I research it and I don't know how to use half the things on Facebook. I don't know how to, you know, I, I still can't figure out the privacy and uh, <laughs> all the settings and, now wait a minute, if I push this, this person can see it, but this person can't. And 
But you need, even if I can't do it, you need to know how to do that. A parent needs to know how to do it because that's part of regaining that generational hierarchy of gaining that power. But it's very interesting because the kids like having that. They like having, in fact, when I first started using texting, and we'll talk a little bit about that too, um, my son said, I'll never forget this, it was a few years ago, and I, I tried it. I was a little f afraid at first. I didn't understand what it was. And I said, this thing is really cool, and I started using it. Now, of course, how many people use texting now in this? Yeah, it's, it's, everyone's using it. So what he said to me when I, uh, he saw me texting, he said, Dad, you can't do that. That's our stuff. That's our, that's, that's, our, that's for kids. That's for adolescents. You know, he didn't use the word adolescent. He, he said, that's for us to do. And um, what he was really talking about is, and it's very interesting, is that texting, and to some extent all of this technology, particularly Facebook, is this generation's separation individuation statement. The, in other words, they've, every generation kind of creates its new, a new language, a new lexography, a new way of expressing itself, either in the form of music or other art. This generation has created a new communication modality, nonverbal. There's no, ver you know, I mean, I mean, I'll, I'll take my kids, I'll be in the car with my kids. Not a word is uttered, but they'll actually be communicating on text. They're talking, but it's all nonverbal. They'll actually text back and forth to each other when they're in the same room rather than use their mouth. So if they keep going, we're going to lose genetically. We're going to actually unselect the, the ability to speak, and in a thousand years, nobody will have vocal cords. Um, so it's very, so we think. We think that texting is an individuation and separation point, and that the technology that kids use, because these, these devices, if you've ever watched the way your kids carry them, they're not really, uh, you know, to us, that we, they're sort of a tool, and it's important to have it, and my schedule is in it, so I look at it all the time to see where I'm supposed to be. Um, to them, it's an accessory. It's part of their clothing. It's part of their identity. And that's why the brand is important. And it's not, it's not enough to have a computer. You have to have a MacBook Pro or some Apple. And, and if you'll notice, a huge majority of the kids have the same device because it's, a, and it's an extension of their identity and their social connection. It's not just a device. To us, it's a device to get a job done. You need a computer to do your email. To them, it's a connection to their culture, to their identity. So that's very different. That's never happened before. Actually, I, if any of you left your phone home and you, are, um, read, uh, you use it regularly, you would feel a little discomfort. And that is technically a sense of withdrawal. Now, it's not the same kind of withdrawal you would have from heroin or alcohol, but it's an, a feeling of ill at ease. So because you are being cut off from your pipeline of information, and what you're really being cut off from, which you're not conscious of, is the dopamine hits. So you do experience a slight sense of withdrawal. And uh, some kids uh, and some adolescents experience that withdrawal in a more serious way and will act out. And uh, certainly, I deal with cases that are more extreme. I deal with cases where the addiction has affected their schoolwork or family relationships. And there, I'm not going to lie to you, there are cases, extreme as they are, where kids have killed their parents when they've taken away the technology. Um, not typical, obviously. It's rare. But they're so wrapped up in it. And they're so, now obviously, yeah. So think twice before you take your kid's <laughs> cell phone away. or um, Don't turn your back when you take it away. <laughs> Okay, those, fortunately those cases are rare, but they have happened, and, and they're obviously shocking and tragic. Um, what, what we really try to teach people in, in, that come to our clinic, and also in general when I do lectures and when I write and I educate people, is that you have to bring consciousness to these devices because they're powerful. And, and the fact that everyone keeps one on them all the time and is uncomfortable if they don't have one, and has psychological and slight physiologic reactions when they don't have it, indicates that it's powerful. So 
these aren't going away. In fact, they're going to get stronger and bigger and more powerful. They're going to be integrated into clothing and jewelry. This is a clunky way to carry your technology. It's, nobody really likes it because you've got to put it in your pocket and you sit on it and you drop it in the toilet. And um, I did that once. Um, and uh, they'll eventually be woven into your clothing. You'll wear it as a band around your wrist. It'll be on your watch. It'll be much more seamless in being able to access it. But all that means is you're going to have it with you even more. Um, I just did a piece on CBS the other day, and a, a large percentage, I can't remember the percent, it was very high, sleep with their phones either next, right next to their head or under their pillow because they don't want, they're that connected to it. Um, now, what's, you know, a lot of, there have been a lot of questions about what is happening to, our, to this generation, Generation D, this 20 and under group, all of who, you, all your kids fall into that group. Is, is any of this detrimental to them? I mean, is this technology or this over-reliance or overuse of this technology causing any problems? And I, I wish I could say no. There are, the jury is out still. There is some mixed data coming in. But overall, there are some pluses and there are some minuses. One of the interesting things about this generation and how many people have, have heard from their kids that they can use, look at their laptop, watch TV, use their iPod, their iPad, and have their cell phone next to them and do their homework, and it's all just as good. How many people have heard that? Okay, it, it, you know when I was a, the, like when I was growing up, I, the idea of watching television and being on a doing something else while you were doing your homework it was it wasn't even an option. What, so finally, we now we have some data on that. And what do you think the data is about multitasking? Ain't no such thing as multitasking. Okay, in fact, there there never was, and there never will be. What we found is, with multitasking, is that you divide the amount of time it takes to comprehend or conclude the primary task. So if it's homework, it, and you have your laptop on Facebook and the television on, then it takes X more time to get that homework done. And uh, so it's, they do get their homework done, but it takes longer. Everything takes longer. and. Um, uh, and there is a slight tendency for more errors because their tension is divided. Um, there's no way to... So we've done tasks where we've actually given kids you know, multiple things and then we look at reading comprehension. And of course, every task that you add, their reading comprehension drops exponentially down uh, as you add those tasks. So no such thing as... So you can go home and tell your kids that there's no such thing as multitasking and take away all those devices and see what happens. And just don't turn your back. Um, okay, the other thing that we're finding with this generation is they have a different way of delaying gratification than previous generations. They're not as good at delaying because the, we live in the pick and click generation. You push one button and instantly you have the information you want you have the email you want, the phone number you want, the phone dials what you want. You order something on Amazon or eBay. Instant, everything is instant. And what's really interesting about this is that <clears throat> the addict in drug use, my original training was in addictionology and looking at addictions. So we applied some of those basic theories to looking at computers and the internet and technology. The speed at which a substance is ingested such that it can produce intoxication determines the addictive potential of that substance. That's why crack cocaine is more addictive than other forms of cocaine because it's absorbed and produces intoxication faster in that modality of transmission than in others. So by and large, the latency, the shorter the latency between the, the hit, whatever it is, and the intoxication, the more addictive it is. So theoretically, what we predicted 10 years ago was as internet speeds increased, as modem and access speed increased, as computers and internet access increased, like now we have 4G on our wireless. So 
instant access, the more addictive it is. And in fact, all the numbers are showing that as we increase the speeds of access, and as that delay between the click and, and that hit, remember that hit gives you that little dopamine rush, the more addictive potential it is. Now, addictive doesn't mean you're going to be on the streets begging for you know, cell phones. But it does mean it will, your life can become unbalanced. It does mean that you will become um, impacted by things that ordinarily wouldn't impact you. It does mean that when you're using these devices, whatever they are, whether they're games, cell phones, the internet, or any of the digital technologies that are integrated to the internet, the big thing is when you're doing those things, you're not doing other things. That's the real deleterious part of this whole process is when you're online, you're not, do, you're not playing sports, you're not doing your homework, you're not relating to people socially, although people would argue that the internet is a social medium and we have tons of data to show that that's actually not true, that people, people who are heavy Facebook users are actually more socially isolated and have higher degrees of isolation than people who do not. Even though it's a so, they call it social media, it's really not social media. I have some interesting thoughts about Skyping, texting, Facebook. I don't, I'm not against texting or um, Skype. I'm not against any of this stuff because it's not going to go away. Um, our kids hang out in cyberspace. They, they hang out virtually. You know, we used to hang out, I don't know where we used to hang out. The mall shop. No, that was, I was at before my time. Uh, the mall. I don't know, we used to hang out somewhere, but it was, it was, a, it was a, a physical place. It was a, you would go somewhere, you would hang out, and you would get into trouble. No, you, wouldn't, you, would, you would hang out, but there would be social interaction. Um, our, this generation, Generation D, 23 and under, hang out in cyberspace. They hang out on Facebook. They're monitoring each other's interactions through their status posts on Facebook. So is that bad? Well, you can't really say it's bad or good. I mean, the jury is really still out on terms of the long-term effects of it, although there's stuff coming in now that it does create some changes in brain chemistry. And there are some differences in the way they process information. We won't know for probably 10, 15, 20 years what the long-term results of all this is. But I'm not upset about the technology because it's better for them to be socially interactive in some way, even if it's virtual, than not at all. Now, do I believe, and I think there's some data to support this, that it is better to have social interaction that is real time as opposed to virtual? And the answer is yes. There, there's, um, because we live in a very high tech world, but there's good data to show that when people have too much high tech, they crave touch. And I don't mean literal touch, but they, create, they crave real-time social interaction. And you can't really, it's not a direct analogous representation when you talk to someone on Facebook or text them. Texting is very flat, and, it's, and there's no innuendo. Even with emoticons and all the devices that they've come up with to try to transmit emotion, I've had more disagreements and misunderstanding in texting than I had anywhere else because it's flat and two-dimensional. There's no nuance. There's no facial expression. This is why I do a lot of interviews for the media. I never do email interviews, also because I can't type. But um, I won't do them because I can't convey the meaning of what I'm saying in a text or in a typed letter. I, there's, no, there's no way to communicate that. So all that's lost in the virtual world. Um, unless there's video and other modalities, and there's some of that. So I think it's a flat form of communication, but I think it's better than nothing. And more importantly, it's this generation's statement. They have stated that this is where they want to live. And if you tell them that they are not living there, they're going to live there more. So you can't, it's too late for us to undo this. I mean, we, we we, by the way, we made the tech, our generation made the technology, although, well, not really, a, a little bit younger than us. Um, but it's not necessarily all bad. Uh, also, texting, I'm not, I, I'm mixed about that as well. I think that, I mean, it drives me crazy when my son's head is buried in the, and all he's doing is this, you know, looking down, and he won't talk. 
I, I mean, I, what I want to do is just take the thing and throw it out the window, um, except that I have to buy him another one. Um, <laughs> But remember, the generational hierarchy, he has all the power, and the kids have the power in the family. Uh, by the way, all this technology, all these memberships to the game systems, all the internet, who do you think pays for all this stuff? Not our kids. We do. So a lot of times, when it, when it gets to a point where it's out of hand, and I mean in an extreme sense, and the, when I say extreme, I'm talking three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten hours of use. Um, and the parent comes in and says, how do I get my kid off of it? I say, well, you turn it off and you stop paying for it. Um, or you take the power cord from the, you know, that can, you can't, the power cords are unique to the device. Um, so, and the other thing that we know is that people, because they lose track of time and space on these devices, most people are incapable. So when a kid says to you, I promise I'll be off the game in, 20 minutes, that is a lie. It's not a lie because they are liars. It's a lie because they are incapable of tracking that 20 minutes. Now, we want, as good parents, we want to believe our kids are going to really come in. Oh, isn't that nice? He says 20 minutes, and I want to trust him. He can't be trusted. She can't be trusted. Although he, it's more likely going to be he than a she. Gaming is still, uh, it's still more male than female, although it's growing in the female direction. I mean, the rule of thumb is one to two hours of total screen time a day, ideally. Screen time would be television, computer, video, pads. Texting is a little bit different because um, it's their primary modality of interaction socially. So I, I do not set limits on the amount of time they text. I will, uh, we do set, limits as to when and where they can. So you know, if you come to the dinner table and you think you're going to have your phone um, set up next to you and you're going to text while you eat, no. Um, or you, you can't bring it into certain situations um, that are required to be social. So if there's friends or family over or social gathering, there can't be a phone out. Um, if there are other people around, if they have company, they can't be texting other people. They have to pay attention to the person that's there. Um, is it perfectly reinfor uh, enforced? No, it's very hard to enforce those rules. But there has to be some. And what I find, and this is true of, of raising adolescents in general, and most of you know this, our kids want some boundaries. They want some limit setting. And it's, the analogy is letting out a fishing line. You let out a little line, you give them some, some freedom, and then you reel it in. If you don't reel it in a little bit, and then they have to push further to individuate and separate. So you want to create something that they have to push against. The trick is to not make it too hard and not make it too easy. And, and if I had the answer to how to do that perfectly, I would, I don't know where I would be, but I, I, I certainly wouldn't have as much stress. Um, so I don't know if I answered your question, but there is no perfect solution to that. But screen time is very important to have limits uh, because it is so addictive. And because, remember what I said, when you're online or on the screen, whatever it is, and now there's so many screens, it's hard to keep track of them, uh, you're not doing other things. Now, what about the kid who's getting straight A's and still using the devices? Um, it's a judgment call. You're going to have to make a judgment in terms of what you think is reasonable and what you think those limits are. The rule of thumb that I've heard, and this is pretty true industry-wide in terms of my field, is in the one to three hour range. I like two hours, but there are times it goes higher, there's times it goes lower. You start getting over three hours, it, you're, it's going to be hard to get everything else done, especially with homework and other, uh, other responsibilities. Um, obviously, I'm an advocate of real-time interaction, and when kids miss re mix real-time interaction with the electronics, I'm not as upset about it. So a lot of the people that my children text to are, their, are part of their social network, and they have real-time relationships with these kids. So I'm not as worried about it. If when kids come in and they're only interacting through Facebook, and they have no real-time, then it's more of a concern, and you have to look at what's going on in their social relationship. Now, what happens, what we're starting to see with some of these kids is that their social skills are atrophy, because they're so used to communicating electronically, 
and typographically and communicating in abbreviation that that same abbreviated way of communicating follows through in verbal interaction and that is a problem. And uh, they will learn very quickly that when they join, when they, where they're gonna really learn about how you can't talk and abbreviate like you know those letters that talk to you later and TT, yeah, like, uh, yeah, what are all those letters that mean things? And I, it, it takes me a while. I, I don't even know what half of them mean. Um, that's how, you know, when I say what? Um, you can't interact in the world like that because the world doesn't function that way. The world wants more, more completion in its communication. So it will be an interesting thing when this generation really hits the job market in full force. And you can't say to your boss, uh, TTYL or what? It, it, well, you be able to. Well, well, your boss is likely to be one, one generation or two generations older. At, now, eventually, as this, these generation, as this is the first generation raised in this technology, as we've got two or three or four, I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, it depends whether that's going to become the new social norm. I think there's going to be a backlash against the cell phone thing and the texting thing. I think people are getting sick of it. I think that you're going to start to see some of the things that have gone down uh, similar to smoking. You're going to see no cell phone restaurants. You're going to see no cell phone. Because people don't, there are some people that don't want, because when I'm, if I pick this up and I start talking on it, even if I walk over it politely to that corner, it creates an ill at ease in other people that are in the room, even if you can't hear me. Because implied when someone's using this device, even if they're texting or emailing, in a social situation where there's real people, the implication is, is that they don't want to be where they are. It, the, the power of these devices is that they shift time and space. Because I'm here, but I'm communicating with something, some, someone somewhere else about tomorrow, I'm texting someone, I'm emailing something, I'm looking at information. So the, the, the unconscious statement that this is making is, where I am is not where I want to be. And that creates a sense of ill at ease. And I think people feel that. They're experimenting in, you know, in the larger cities where these things, you know, where it's, it's a completely, the penetration is almost 100%. Um, there are restaurants that have rooms where there's no cell phones. Um, it's hard to see where it's going to go. I mean, I'm convinced that most of the addictive uh, elements to this, to all these devices, is the variable ratio reinforcement schedule. I'm thoroughly convinced of that. But there are other factors, and there's three pages here which I'll put up for you to just take a quick look at, of other factors. But one of the things we initially thought was, you remember the old monitors before we had the flat ones? You know, the big clunky ones? There are scan lines that run across those at 60 cycles per second. Um, and, we th and there's some evidence to show that that creates a hypnotic effect and that that's what people were reacting to in terms of their trance response. But that we found that not to be true because as soon as we switched to LCD screens, which don't have any of that, the addictive potential still continued. So um, there are some people that believe that electromagnetic radiation is toxic and addictive. I have to be honest with you, I don't have much knowledge of that, so I can't speak uh, about it uh, intelligently. Um, I have had, I had, after I did the CBS show the other day, I got a phone call from some guy saying, demanding that I come out publicly about the dangers of electromagnetic, but I don't know anything about it. You do need to know what your kids are doing online. You do need to know what they're doing with their cell phones. You do need to have appropriate blocks I mean, this, uh, this workshop is not really about internet safety per se, but I will make a comment about that. You do need to have appropriate blocks. We didn't even talk about sex, and I can tell you that the internet, I mean, sex made the internet. So uh, without going into more detail, everything and anything that, that you can imagine is on there and is accessible. If there are not blocks, it is too tempting. So you do need to have limits, you do need, and you have to assume they're gonna break those limits, and you, have, you do have to enforce it. And unfortunately, there's no way to do it except you gotta you know, poke your nose in and say, what are you doing? Who are you communicating with? What's, who's your, on your friends list? Um, you need to insist, and most of you probably already know this, that you be a friend of your kid. Um, now, they may find that, you know, abhorrent, 
but you absolutely should be on your kid's friends list so you see what they're putting up. If you don't, you have no idea what they're doing. You have to be on their friends list, uh, friend list. Um, I didn't say that right. Um, and uh, and I, I will tell you, I've seen both in terms of my patients as well as uh, friends and family members where I've picked up, uh, you know, cell phones. The, the, the ability for these things to record photos and video, you've put the ability to record and broadcast to the world instantly in the hands of creatures whose brains aren't done yet. Okay, think about that. You've, you've put the capacity to broadcast to the world instantly in, the, in, the, in somebody's hands whose brain won't be done till they're about 22, 23, give or take if they're lucky. Okay, so that means um, <laughs> some, <laughs> okay, maybe yours will be done sooner. <laughs> um, but that's, it's just too tempting. The, capa the ability to have that technology, it's too, so you can assume that there are gonna be bad decisions made and you have to check these devices. You have to check their photos, you have to check their video, you have to see who they're communicating. And, but this is the same thing if we were talking 20 years ago about, and I was here giving a lecture about drugs, I would say you need to know who your kids' friends are, you need to know where they're going, you need to know where they're coming, you need to know when they're coming back. Same thing, being an involved parent is being an involved parent, but now not only do you have to be involved, you have to be knowledgeable about these devices and how to use them and how to get around them. And if you don't know and they won't tell you, you have to find some informed parent who knows enough about it to tell you. By the way, anything you put on your computer or any, uh, not so much the smartphone, but anything that's, that's downloaded or looked at, there's a record of. And uh, anything that's put on your hard drive, there is an imprint of, even if you erase it. So if your kids get curious and they look at some websites uh, of content that is illegal, and I, I have seen this, uh, and they erase it, there's still a trace of that, and that can be discovered. And l let me tell you something. The internet, email, texting, anything digital, is the worst way to communicate information that you don't want someone to know about. Actually, you know what the best way to communicate if you don't want someone to know about it right now? That's right, the old fashioned telephone with a wire on it. That's the, the, with a wire, it has to have a wire. So, you know, if you don't have a phone in your house with a wire, get one. Uh, it doesn't have to have a dial. <laughs> my, ki my kids saw a phone with a dial not too long ago, and literally they didn't know what it was. They literally, they, they didn't, they, they, and they couldn't figure out, they couldn't figure out what to do with the dial, like that you put your finger and turn it like that. Um, but the, I'm serious, the least private way to communicate is anything electronic. There is a record of all of it. And, and I've seen those transcripts in my office, and they're pretty shocking when you see. So anything you say or do on your cell phone, not necessarily vocally, there's no tape of your calls, although they can be electronically uh, eavesdropped, um, even though they're digital, but certainly email, texting, anything that's typed, anybody can get a call. You know, it's there. It's reproducible, and there are records of it. So be careful. It is the least anonymous form of communication. Now, what's really interesting is when we looked at, when we surveyed people, one of the things that we, we found the most, where is it, is anonymity. Um, people believe that the internet is an anonymous source. So because of that, they experience a sense of disinhibition when they communicate online, and they do and say things that they ordinarily would not do when they're communicating online, and that's how they get themselves into trouble. So they'll, they'll actually take on a, a more dis, uh, a disinhibited way of interacting socially, and that's why people get more, report being more intimate more quickly in their email communication than they do ordinarily. Um, and that's what we call accelerated intimacy. There was something else I wanted to show you. The other interesting thing about the brain is that it doesn't like unfinished business. There's something called the Zagarnik effect. Um, so if, if there's a piece of information, like you, if you're thinking about a song and you can't think of the last 
word in the song, you'll keep going back to that over and over again because the brain wants to complete a thought and form a complete gestalt and finish it. What do you think, how do you think that's relevant to the internet? If you're gonna surf for information or check your email, when are you done? When do you have the information? Never, never. The internet is the, it, there's always another link, another hypertext, another place to go, another email, like literally as you're on the computer, emails are coming in. It's completely dynamic and fluid. You're never done with it. So it compels continued use over and over and over. And by the way, that's the same as Facebook. Because what's, why your kids keep looking at it is because that status page is always changing. People are feeding data in and it's changing. Now it's inane information from my perspective, no judgment intended, but it's, you know, it's, it's, what's really interesting is I went to this new uh, burger place, which I would highly recommend, and for, uh, the one in West, West Harvard Center, uh, and there was a girl at the cash register, um, and I was talking with her, and she knew stuff about my kid, and I said, oh, well, how did you know that? And she said, Facebook. So, like, information is exchanged quickly, sometimes more quickly than, I mean, she had information that I didn't have yet because they post it instantly. That is their hangout, that is their social network. Uh, and for, like it, for better or for worse, that's where they go. That's where they go. And the best that you can do is know how they do it, when they do it, how much they do it, and what they're saying and doing online because they will abuse it if you're not conscious of it. So when, when, how do you know when you're crossing the line online? The rule of thumb is that you're looking at the balance in their lives. Theoretically, if you have a child or an adolescent that is getting straight A's in school, has relationships with other kids, is physically healthy, is eating, is getting enough sleep, is um, not committing any crimes, and they happen to like video games and they play a couple hours of video games a day, it's not a problem. If they're spending four or five, it's pretty hard to stay balanced in the major spheres of your life when you start to go up beyond that two or three hour mark simply because how can you keep track of all the things that you have to do if you're spending five or six hours. Generally the, the, the sweet spot seems to be over two or three hours. Um, but there's no exact number that you know if you use three hours and ten minutes you're addicted because the, the, the the criteria for addiction really is defined by two things. And as I said, addiction is not a really a medical term. The two medical terms that refer to addicted addiction are abuse and dependence. So are you abusing it or are you dependent on it? Very few people are dependent on it. There is a small percentage that are, but a lot of people abuse it. There are two questions that you ask is, are you using it to alter mood and consciousness? In other words, is your child using it like a drug? Are they depressed? Are they lonely? Are they tired? Are they scared? Is there family problems? Are they using it to escape or to medicate themselves in some way because there's something else going on in their life? Perhaps, and we don't know whether that's true or not. And then two, is it, does it have a deleterious effect in some major sphere of their life? Are their grades dropping? Are they becoming more socially isolated? Is their mood changing? Have they lost their friendships? Um, are they uh, hanging out with a different group of kids? Are they ignoring, are they committing crimes? You're looking for the same markers that you would look for with drugs or alcohol or, or gambling. You're looking for changes in basic personality and functioning. So if you, if you can answer yes to one or both of those questions, then there may be an issue. May, I say maybe because you don't know without doing a, a thorough assessment. That's when you might bring them to see me or somebody else. There's data on, on what we call tolerance. So um, just, like, um, just like with drugs, we have a tolerance effect or alcohol. You have to drink a certain amount or consume a certain amount of the substance to reach intoxication and that rises. We found that true with particularly uh, with sex. Um, the, the content that is stimulating at level A you become satiated and you have to go to level B, level C, level D. And this is where we create, this is where problems occur. Uh, that's true with gaming too in terms of intensity. By the way, remember games are designed with the same variable ratio reinforcement schedule that everything else is. They're designed from the ground up and I've spoken to gaming developers. They design the game to give you intermittent, unpredictable and variable rewards. 
That's, and they know exactly how long you'll stay on it. If you want to know the most addictive internet-based video game or computer game in the world right now is World of Warcraft. Uh, so if your kid comes home and says, can you buy me World of Warcraft for Christmas or Hanukkah or, or my birthday? Just say no. I mean, don't, don't even like discuss it. It's that bad. We recommend that people leave their cell phones home one day a week or to leave them in the car if you go into a restaurant or a store, not to take it with you. To start to break those, those cycles, those um, uh, reinforcement cycles that your brain has adapted to. And, and, and if you doubt what I'm saying, just try it and you'll actually feel a little weird. You're like, whoa, I don't have my phone. Like, okay, well, so unless there's an emergency you're expecting, a, but it, can you go into a restaurant for a half an hour without your phone? Um, can you turn it off when you're home? Um, what we also have is some data about, because we've adopted this technology, we took it from our kids, um, that kids are upset, especially younger kids, when parents are on the phones and they're ignoring their children. So we, we've actually seen it in the reverse, too, where kids <coughs> feel neglected and ignored, and there have been some really horrendous cases where parents have been so involved in the technology, particularly gaming, and in fact, there was one couple recently that was arrested for child neglect because they were habitually using a video, a computer game that was a practice game for how to raise a child. They were raising an artificial child on the game and they neglected their own child. I, I, honestly, I'm not making this up. And they were arrested because they were neglecting their child. If, the, if a child has a real problem with a particular content area, whether it's gaming or pornography or, or something like that, you can put in software that will link, uh, I'm sorry, will block access to those. But they, it has to be software that is router based. If it's on the computer, your kid will figure a workaround. I mean, remember, your kids know this technology better than you do. So I have an IT guy that works for me, and all he does is go into my patients' homes and set up and bulletproof their systems so the husband or the kid or the cousin or whomever has got the problem can't get into certain sites because it's not all the internet that's a problem, it's certain content areas that seem, and the two biggest abused areas on the, on the internet are not email and texting, they're pornography and gaming. Those are the two big ones. Is there a block for Facebook? There is. Yeah, you can block Facebook, you can block anything actually. You know, by the time somebody is really using and abusing something and they know people are wanting them to stop, they get really good at finding the ways around it. So we have to, we, you have to work at the router level, not on the laptop itself or on the computer itself. The real problem are these things, because these things now with 4G, they have you know, equivalent uh, cable modem speed that you can see movies and videos, and, and uh, blocking software is hard to put on these devices, especially Apple devices. Um, real problem. And if you don't think your kids are looking at stuff that you don't want them looking at, I wish I could say you're wrong, but you're not wrong, but you are. So we haven't figured out what to do with these. This is, this is really where the, the big growth is going to be, is how to deal with these issues. These devices are getting faster and more powerful every day. And now that they're 4G, you're going to be able to watch a, a videos, some of which you don't want your kids seeing. Um, on these devices, and it's going to be very hard to block because you can't block them at a router if they have internet access. Now, you could not have internet access on these. I mean, um, some people argue, Do you, does your kid really need a smartphone? I mean, that I could say, I don't see a reason why a kid has to have a smartphone. I do think that your, a child has to have a, a computer to do homework and research. But I will tell you that most of the time when your kid, and I, I hate to say this, but I know from my own experience, and most of the time when your kid says they're doing homework, they're on Facebook. There, there are software programs you can put on, even uh, uh, Windows-based machines that will shut the machine off or shut the internet access off after a certain period of time. Um, we're big advocates of having a clock next to the computer, so to, you know, not the little clock that's in the, because nobody looks at that, but something that, so you can really see the passage of time. Well, thank you, thank you.